co-editor of the Advertising Handbook in 2018 and 2013. He's also the editor of Routledge Critical Advertising Series. Um, again, an important contribution to the field, an important venue, avenue for the voices of young and emerging, as well as established um, critical perspectives on advertising. Jonathan is also the founder of UAL's Branded Content Hub, which has been a really important contribution to the research culture at LCC and UAL, as well as providing an industry-facing and academic um, hub for insights into this field. Um, just to say on a personal note, you know, Jonathan joined us in uh, mid-2020 at the peak, early peak of the pandemic. And I think that's a really difficult thing to do, but Jonathan has negotiated this institution expertly and already in the short time he's been with us has become indispensable through his research activities, leadership, teaching and curriculum activities. Um, I would also like to say, just uh, to introduce the book, Branded Content, as a researcher in the field, it's a tremendous challenge to, you know, balance the sort of land, landscape macro perspective that Jonathan does, along with the really um, detailed insights that you get from industry and case studies, which Jonathan has done um, really uh, expertly. It's a testament to both his encyclopedic knowledge um, and his impressive vision that his latest book on branded content provides such a critical landscape of both the historical and contemporary state of media and marketing, its practices, its policies and problems, as well as a critical analysis of its future implications. So um, on, that, on that note, it is with great pleasure that I turn to Jonathan Hardy to uh, tell us and introduce us to his book um, and the work of the Branded Content Research Hub. Thank you very much indeed, Zoe. And I'm also gonna just flip over to uh, presentation mode. I hope you can see. No, thank you very much for that. I really appreciate the introduction. So welcome, everybody. Um, let me just kick off by saying there are kind of several purposes today. One is to launch the book, um, unfortunately, remotely and without refreshments, but we'll try and make amends and invite you back uh, for those later. I also want to talk about the book and more broadly, the book's themes. And I want to launch a series of talks and their host, the Branded Content Research Hub. So just to explain that, the hub has its origins in a project funded by the UK Research Council, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which ran from 2016 to 17 with a series of events and a major international conference that established also the Branded Content Research Network. I was principal investigator with my colleague, uh, Professor Ian McCrory, as co-investigator. And since I moved in June 2020 to my new home in the media school at the London College of Communication, part of University of the Arts London, uh, I set about building a new resource to continue the work. And I'm really delighted to say that we now have the Branded Content Research Hub here. Um, which will carry out research and collaborative projects. And we've also relaunched really just in the last few weeks. So I'm delighted to be able to present and announce that the Brandy Content Research Network as a wider network bringing together academics so far from across five continents, as well as Brandy Content practitioners and others. So that network is open to academic staff, students, industry practitioners, policy actors, and civil society stakeholders, anyone with an interest in branded content. So I'll share some details of our forthcoming events and activities um, at the end, but you can find details by searching for the hub. For my talk today, I want to draw, of course, particularly on material from the book, as well as one or two ideas and developments since it's been published. But I'll also just mention in that regard, um, this, which I'll touch on, which was a special issue of digital journalism on sponsored content, branded content in, in news journalism in particular. So we'll come back to this, but just have a look. There's a definition there of sponsored editorial content as material with similar qualities and format content typically published on a platform or by a content provider, but which has been paid for by a third party, um, usually a brand. So um, here's an overview of what I want to do in the next 40, 45 minutes. 
I've really got six areas just to reassure you, but we'll open out to the broader topic of media marketing convergence um, in, in Q&A and discussion. So I'd like to start with an overview. One key aim of the book is to provide an account of the development of forms of branded content in a way that attends to history that asks about how and in what ways marketing practices have changed and also attends to meanings, definitions, demarcations and discourses of all those involved in branded content. A second key aim was to contribute to thinking about the convergence of media and marketing and what this means for the industries involved, but also for societies, and in the book and in other writings, I've also reflected on what convergence in media marketing means for us in the academy, for universities and for education in general. And I'd like to open up that topic too with you today. The third key aim of the book is to clarify and develop critical arguments about branded content. So if those first two aims require close attention and appreciation of branded content, the third, developing critical arguments, requires giving voice to problems and setting out suggestions on how to address those. Uh, and I want to try and cover that with you today. The book itself is organised in two parts and I want to reassemble those as well. So the first part is on practices and the second part is called policies and problems. And these are all related. Um, so to summarise the core argument of the book, um, I argue that there are different kinds of branded content that give rise to different kinds of problems. The growth of brands creating and distributing their own content does raise some problems, but the greatest problem area arises when branded content is integrated into media content. That causes a problem for users, uh, whether and how well they can identify communications that are funded or supported by brands. But I argue it also is a problem about communications themselves, about the qualities and integrity of the media. So part one of the book discusses practices. Part two is an exploration of problems and what I call policies. And um, partly it has to be said for alliterative reasons, because that might be better described as governance, which I'll talk more about, but I find a very useful term for thinking about and connecting all forms of rulemaking and the behaviours and arrangements by which rules get enacted, applied, articulated and negotiated. This book is part of ongoing research, uh, a big plans for a research project that will investigate the changing governance of branded content, influencer marketing, and the broader interface of marketing and media um, across the media. And to use that research to inform and influence policymaking, rulemaking and best practice, and wider public understanding. And all, all those aims, I hope this session can also make a modest contribution to. Okay, so part one. Um, Definitions and demarcations. There has been, um, I can see Bjorn Asmussen in my screen, uh, someone who knows this very well from his own work. There has been a lot of definitional debate about branded content and it's ongoing. Um, for the hub, we use a simple short description. Um, content that is funded or produced by marketers. And I like that because it's broad, encompassing and because it highlights two issues that are very important in this debate payment and control if everyone and everything can be promotional i argue that when we're looking at branded content we're tracing some important features that distinguish the forms of advertising and marketing communications I, i'm examining firstly they're industrially organized uh, they might involve non-professional participants, but at their core, they are networked as industrially org organised activities and they involve payment or more broadly the use of resources and they involve issues, questions of control and where it lies. Another kind of 
simple definition, a way in would be that branded content covers informational and or entertainment content that is sponsored by marketers. Another definition is branded content is whatever is not conventional advertising which is also helpful, of course, in indicating that a key driver behind branded content is to communicate outside of the restrictions associated with conventional advertising on the producer side, but perhaps even more so on the consumer side, overcoming resistance to advertising. However, this drive to be new, to be non-conventional, involves sets of claims that need to be interrogated. And here I think there's a key role for independent academic scrutiny. Most advertising on social media is now labelled and regarded in the industry as native, as blending in, as becoming native to its environment and surroundings. But while it is certainly in feed, it appears in our social media feeds, it's also very often still interruptive and quite conventional. In, in, in form two. So the claim to be native needs to be interrogated. And the book argues this is one example of why we need to view definitional debates as competitive struggles for definitional advantage and struggles at which there's much at stake, commercially to build a case for brand spending, but also in terms of critical reception by consumers and society because that in turn informs how regulation and governance proceeds. For those of you who are perhaps less familiar with this field, and apologies to those who aren't, I, I do think a useful way in is a model called PISO, which stands for paid, owned, earned and shared. And it highlights that we are at a point of convergence and intermingling across paid advertising, traditional public relations, which achieves earned media, the social amplification and movement of commercial messages shared and owned, brands rapidly expanding and extending the content they produce themselves. So I think that's a useful model, but as I argue in the book, um, it has one significant flaw. Uh, it's ahistorical. It's a mapping of ingredients. But I think if we want to understand what's happening, we need to add back in a historical dimension. So I argue, and I've done this in a number of, of pieces of work, that the characteristic relationship of media and advertising in the mid 20th century was integration. Advertising was carried in the same vehicles as media um, in magazine covers, uh, in between television and radio shows but it was also separated. There was a separation principle that was generally upheld by news journalists, supported by their managers, underpinned by self-regulatory codes across uh, media and advertising that they should be identified um, clearly as distinct and separate and subject to stronger statutory regulation in sectors like European broadcasting. And that mid 20th century model, I argue, is giving way to two tendencies which are going in opposite directions, but are linked. Um, the one which is really the focus of today is integration without separation, forms of branded content. Um, one of the historical ones, of course, is product placement. And just to bring that up a little bit more to date, um, Netflix, for example, like other streamers, is today heavily involved in brand integration, particularly in their original productions. So some research from 2018 found that 100% of Amazon's original programming contained brand integrations, 91% of Hulu. Netflix then was actually a little bit lower on 74%. Um, Netflix is now a space for brand funded documentaries like Patagonia's Artificial. And there's a complex uh, commercial dalliance between Netflix brand partnership group and brands who want to reach its young upscale audience. In 2019, Netflix Stranger Things did deals, for example, with 75 brands, partly to um, uh, bring in income, but perhaps even more importantly, as Netflix 
um, argued to drive cross promotion towards Netflix. And in that same year, 2019, um, Netflix developed some of the first interactive product placement in the interactive film Black Mirror Bandersnatch. Um, my room is a lovely eco room, so I have to. Oh, good. Lights have come back on. Um, to, to show. OK, so two key trends then integration without separation, but mixing with the trend towards disaggregation. Marketers are now less dependent on the intermediary role of media publishers, can track and target consumers directly, and increasingly deal with platforms for ad targeting and placement. So key arguments um, that across much, but certainly not all branded content, we're seeing a shift from the separation of media and advertising towards integration. And while analyzing power dynamics are always complex, I argue a key feature underlying both of these trends, integration and disaggregation, is a power shift between marketers and ad dependent media that favors marketers. Dependence has increased and marketers have benefited and expanded into that space. OK, um, I also argue and I draw on industry models here that there are three main types of branded content. And this is important because I say they give rise to different kinds of problems and the main problems are located in the second and third of these categories. So the first category, huge expansion is brands own content, so-called own media appearing on their own websites, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and so on. The second area it has certainly the greatest market expansion and it involves the native, and I'll put that in inverted commas because as I say, I'm not convinced all of it is, but the native distribution of marketers paid advertising. Ads integrated into web pages, apps, news feeds in social media. Um, and certainly the biggest growth has been in native ads in social media accessed via mobile phones. One of the ways we encounter this second group is also in the sponsor stories that you see at the bottom of publishers' websites assembled by content recommendation uh, companies like Outbrain and Taboola. And the third area is editorial-like content that's hosted by or made by publishers, which may be controlled by publishers, by advertisers, or jointly. Of these three types, um, the first is brand's own media. Um, it's normally pretty clear, whatever else, that it's a brand speaking. While the second and third are forms of paid advertising. And in these cases, it's the blurring of advertising with editorial and the subsequent confusion about control, where control over the content lies that generates much of the controversies surrounding branded content. And I'll open that up in a, in a moment. Just very briefly um, set this in the context of development. Well, I'm very keen, like others, to keep a historical perspective. And therefore, we should remember that branded content is old, not new. Um, the furrow from the late 19th century was a kind of um, contract publication, we would now call it, um, for an agricultural manufacturer. Um, from 1900, the Michelin Guide as a way to promote um, car use, uh, building a, a, a map of France and a map of restaurants and so on. And these are important. I think I try to argue in the book that we always need to trace the long histories of all phenomena and certainly not try to locate their origins when that isn't the case in the digital age, however much they may have intensified. But equally, I hope I've made clear from what I've said that alongside this history, which is often advocated to kind of naturalize branded content, it's always been with us. Um, I'd also highlight that history of separation being established too in the 20th century, which is now under threat. Um, now here, I've just tried to sort of capture and illustrate some features of the phase we're actually in now. Um, the more modern phase of digital branded content. Just pick out uh, a couple of things from this. Um, 
Certainly my book talks about some of the very early efforts to create uh, branded entertainment, um, often in the form of short form video. Um, the takeoff phase around about 2015, when um, the American Association of Marketers named content marketing word of the year. A period since then of sort of growing proliferation and sophistication of uh, branded content formats. So the growth of AR, VR, experiential uh, branded content and so on. And then I just pick up uh, some of the volatility in this space um, to illustrate. So for example, in 2017, news publishers desperately confronting the collapse of traditional advertising revenues, were really hailing native advertising as a key growth area, um, seen as the most second most important revenue generator after advertising. But a similarly weighted global study a few years later showed some of the kind of confidence um, shifting uh, and, and here you see, you know, some movement, native advertising branded content is still up in the top three, but it's been displaced by subscription. And then finally on this slide, um, a projection by Ad You Like that there would be a five-fold increase in branded content revenues between um, 2020 and 2025. But that projection was made in 2019 and like others um, didn't foresee the impact of COVID. So first key point is there has been growth, quite tremendous growth in branded content, but it remains uneven. Publishing in particular has seen a drop off and an increasing uncertainty, even though it's grown in other areas. To understand what's happening, um, apologies for a slightly dense slide trying to capture this, but Really, the key point from this is just it's multifactorial um, and we should recognise that. Different drivers, different pressures and incentives um, for publishers, um, a way of trying to attract back that lost ad revenue. For agencies, uh, a sense that storytelling and entertainment could cut through um, harder to reach, increasingly hard to reach audiences, overcome the rise of ad blocking and so on. Um, consumers shifting in their selection and use of media, the technical opportunities branded content has given for marketers themselves to be much more enabled to um, put together um, digital advertising. But also this story I'll pick up of shifts in professional norms. So Matt Carlson, for example, highlighting in journalism the weakening of the principle of separation, so-called church and state separation in, in US journalism parlance. Um, and, you know, the growth of new normativities, new ways of thinking about branded content. For example, the idea that, that perhaps journalists should be curators, putting together a mix of whatever was relevant for readers, whether that was produced by a brand or by its own journalism. And then I leave as a question mark um, to come on to the question of, of regulation in this story. So, as I mentioned, Ad You Like, um, not anticipating COVID, um, nor indeed this slide. So, on the one hand, showing a classic set of statistics of growth for branded content, um, but actually 2020 didn't turn out uh, quite as predicted. So, we should note that volatility, we should also note, um, going back to definitions, that um, this is all subject to claims. And it was rather depressing for me as a researcher to find that Gartner's famous hype cycle had already placed native advertising on the slide of um, former great hopes um, to transform marketing, to sliding down um, it towards the trough of disillusionment. Um, so we must bear that in mind too. Um, 
in the book, I explore different scenarios about how things could turn out, whether branded content may be a short lived phenomena, maybe it's an anticipator of quite a different phase of relationships to come um, and explore those. But my central argument is we should certainly not just treat branded content as another tool in the marketing mix because a much more profound shift, I think, is taking place. A deeper convergence, set of convergences, is occurring between media and marketing. And it's occurring in different domains, which are linked but not identical. Corporate arrangements, um, advertisers becoming media companies, media companies um, and publishers becoming advertising agencies. Practices, what people do and how they understand what they do the personnel movements from marketing expertise to media and, and vice versa, the governing values and norms, how people understand what it is they are and they do, um, the various forms of branded content and formats. And I argue that these have profound implications for the industries and their reconfiguration for consumers, but also for societies. Now, um, just to frame this widely for a second, um, this is really just to set us up if we want to discuss this in the Q&A uh, rather than elaborate. But I would argue that the 20th century was shaped by a core triad of relationships by parties who were interlocked and interdependent, but generally had separate identities marketers, brands, the agencies that serve them and the media that they placed advertising with. For the present, we need to expand that. And I argue we need to move from a triad to a sextet. Um, some of the players are still identifiable, but they've all expanded and hybridized and taken on new forms. So of course, if we were dealing with marketing agencies now, we'd have to bring in the talent agencies, the influencer marketing agencies, and their um, configured forms, which are certainly not the same as those which govern more traditional industry relations um, in the 20th century. So we've got the old players adding new forms and we've got new players. I think we should separate out content creators to make the point that so many of them are outside the old professional networks, uh, many influences in particular that governed the old relations of the 20th century. And we certainly need to factor in platforms as new major players um, accruing advertising and advertising services and ad tech because the automating automation of all of these processes also transforms practices, normativities, um, and the human computer interaction. So that's perhaps to set up a wider framework we can come back to. Um, I'd now like to move on to get to problems and do so by just focusing uh, for a moment or two on publishing. So as I mentioned, some of the new native publishers like BuzzFeed, um, set up in 2006, um, eschewed standard advertising right from the start and got their income from brands through things like this, um, branded listicles. In 2014, as that earlier slide mentioned, we also saw celebrated but also infamous breakthroughs such as Netflix owning um, the front page of a distinguished American newspaper, the New York Times, to promote Orange is the New Black. And incidentally, Netflix certainly continues to be a real innovator in this space, creating branded content around its shows. Um, in India recently, it created a spat between two actors to promote the black comedy thriller AK versus AK in 2020, for example. Advertising that resembles editorial long predates the digital age, but brands are increasingly involved in the production of publisher hosted content. So to feed into thinking about the problems, I'd just like to quickly share two examples with you. Um, one with apologies, because um, some of you may have even heard me speak about this one before, but the context for both actually is being invited to be a judge 
um, to select examples of the worst sponsored content for Byline's annual Bad Press Awards, which I'm delighted to learn are back um, and are being listed again uh, and are coming up in March. So the first example is from The Guardian, uh, taken from the paper Saturday Magazine Supplement. It was an issue that contained five double page spreads marked paid content produced by The Guardian's sponsored content unit, Guardian Labs, for Jaguar, Nestle, San Miguel, Airbnb, this one, but also Greenpeace. So we should note that branded content for the service, not just of commercial players, but also NGOs. For this piece I'm showing you for Airbnb, the premise is a diary report on a city break to Paris, written by Gemma Briggs, who visited with her partner, Alex and child. The couple stay in the apartment of a film director who leaves them champagne. Two-year-old Nell is goggle-eyed at the owner's colourful artefacts and doesn't break any. In her own diary, Nell, describes the Pompidou Center as cool and awesome and mentions her comfy apartment bed. Impressive, I thought, since the average vocabulary of a two-year-old is 240 words. Gemma's account, the mother, consists of 23 sentences, of which 10 refer directly to the Airbnb apartment. The level of control and construction of the communication marks this as a form of branded wisdom to use Naomi Klein's evocative phrase, I argue. Second example is from the Birmingham Mail. Very standard piece marked special features. Why Hansworth Grammar School has been rated outstanding. So a standard piece of advertorial content produced by the brand. However, this was during a period in particular when the presence of grammar schools has been an active public policy issue. And so I argue there's a problem in giving voice here solely to the grammar school in quasi editorial space, especially in a paper which did cover elsewhere, at least the policy debate on the desirability of grammar schools. So with those examples in mind, let me um, outline problems. Um, and I argue there are three main problem areas. The first on consumer awareness, consumer protection is the dominant one across policy and regulation. And it's important, of course, but it dominates and displaces, I argue, to varying degrees, the other two. So this is about consumer awareness of advertising and prompts requirements around labeling, disclosure and identification. There is weaker and I would argue weakening protection for the second area of concern, for what this means for the quality and integrity of media channels themselves, and widening that to issues of editorial independence, artistic and creative independence and integrity. Those still exist, they have a traceable presence, but they're becoming residual. Perhaps you might not be surprised to hear me argue that um, the last area, marketers share a voice, which is the concern of a more radical perspective about the extension of marketers' power across communications. Marketers share a voice in our communication space and the system-wide consequences of communication provision privileging marketers' voices um, gets very little space in here, in policy at least. And that includes what I would call the corporate ventriloquism at work in that Airbnb example, um, which renders the voices of the tourists and their child both embodied and inauthentic. So those are problems. And I want to finish really by just giving you a mapping and a view of how they're being addressed in policy and regulation. So um, if you'll forgive me, there's one expansion out into a slightly more academicized register, but I'll be very brief. So I actually argue that governance is a really valuable and key concept for us because it can invite us to think about all the processes by which rule shaping behavior is constructed. 
and it can alert us to when that's happening in formal spaces, if you like, the law and regulation, but also very informal spaces. What people in a particular agency say to each other and decide is OK or not OK. What people pick up in the wider discussions and discourses going on in trade magazines or indeed to a limited extent in general media. So I think governance is a very powerful and versatile concept. And if you forgive me just packing out there um, some of the ingredients of that argument, essentially I argue that governance is a versatile way to help us reconnect studies of media production with me questions of media policy and regulation. We can bind together um, through the concept of governments sets of concerns which are often too separated and segregated. We can link questions of the macro level, what's happening at the level of national or supranational policy, right through to the micro level, as I say, the conversation between two people in a workplace. Um, so I think it's a very versatile uh, approach. And if we're going to do it properly and take the challenge of governance seriously, we've got to say, well, what are all the spaces where rule shaping occurs? And they're numerous. And how they interact is still a challenge for all researchers. How do we connect studies of debates happening in social media amongst groups of professionals with with formal rules and regulations but we need all of it. so that's the framework slightly simpler framework uh, is to think about the key agencies of influence and governance uh, and i would boil them down to these four areas so that sort of formal space of law and regulation first then the space which is becoming so important particularly in fast-moving spaces like branded content for industry self-regulation, for codes and good practice. And interestingly here, of course, increasingly the role not just of human-centered decisions, but code and technology um, coming in too. Thirdly, um, market power, how consumers can exercise power and influence, how ad blocking, for example, is an expression of consumer power in markets. And then finally, civil society, how NGOs, pressure groups, the linkages between academics uh, and, and civil society groups, ca canonism. Also, forgive me a summary. This is an attempt to just collect together uh, some ingredients to think about governance trends, thinking particularly about the United States and the UK. So I would argue we have seen um, an extension of new rules, particularly in the area of consumer protection, but they're quite limited, particularly in not addressing um, protection for the media independence and integrity I outlined. And their adherence and enforcement action is also very limited. We've seen contradictory messages, quite complex messages from the industry. On the one hand, upholding these quite deep rooted principles of disclosure and identification. Um, the International Chamber of Commerce, which had uh, rules on advertising dating back to 1937, introduced for the first time in 1966, um, a clear clause on identification that um, ads should be clearly distinguishable as such. Um, uh, so we have that. On the other hand, there's plenty of evidence of lobbying by companies against governments and regulators calling for more flexibility. Um, we know, but it's not very well documented from people who worked for the regulators themselves, how much flack they get um, against when decisions go against the company. Overall, um, lots of evidence from researchers of poor levels of consumer recognition. So the rules that we do have for disclosure are not working. Um, poor levels of adherence. And interestingly in this space, um, consumer demand for better protection and more regulation. So just to put a little bit of flesh on that, I actually argue that there are two key paradoxes which would help us understand this space. The first one is one I've just mentioned. We have a code from 1966 
setting out a clear statement on the identification of advertising. But we have the paradox of successive waves of integrated and disguised ads ever since, certainly in the digital age. And the second paradox docs within this is actually increasing regulatory attention. We've seen um, the Federal Trade Commission produce these powerful rules uh, that this slide shows in 2015. Other governments, Australia, the UK, across Europe, the same, yet massive non-observance. A UK Advertising Standards Authority report last March um, tracked 24,000 posts by 122 UK-based influencers, which revealed, uh, and this is a quote, a disappointing overall rate of compliance. In fact, 65% of all the pieces they looked at weren't sufficiently labelled as ads according to the rules. So massive non-observance. Um, and the FTC, as I outline in my book, has only had 10 cases of enforcement action uh, in the six years since these 2015 rules, which if you imagine the size of America, the leading edge of a marketing and commercial economy, 10 cases seems um, remarkably few. Uh, in Europe, uh, the UK is still governed by European rules, um, uh, managed by the com Competition and Markets Authority. So just note one of those. It's not allowed to use editorial content to pay to promote a product um, where a trader has paid without making clear in the content or by images and sounds that it's an ad. So if you pay, you have to declare, uh, says Europe. Well, part of the explanation for the paradox I just outlined is what I would argue is the separation, the separate paths, which still influence and govern how this space is regulated. So just to give you an idea of that, um, we've had really since the 1960s, uh, a big separation between the regulation of media, the press here, um, now uh, managed by Impress and Ipso, two regulators, and the regulation of advertising. So this blended, thing, branded content, is sitting in the middle of tram lines which were laid down in the 20th century and are insufficient to deal with the more converged landscape. But I would argue that it's beyond that. Um, that's a partial explanation, but if, if these are path dependencies, to use the term institutionalists would use, they're also opportunistic path de dependencies. In other words, um, they, they have served by being ineffective the larger powerful interests of commercial media marketers who drive um, the self-regulatory code and standards and to, to an extent enforcement. So just to illustrate that and perhaps some of the position we're in at the moment, um, the Advertising Standards Authority applies this rule to branded content in publishing, to native advertising. If the content is paid for and controlled by brands, uh, then it needs to be declared. Um, however, this creates a, an important gap in enforcement. Um, the earlier rules I just outlined to you, uh, which the CMA uh, is responsible for, um, says if you pay, there has to be disclosure. But the CMA doesn't investigate individual cases. It takes actions against industry sectors. So there's a gap in enforcement. Under the Advertising Standards Authority rules, um, the requirements are dual, not simply payment, but control over content. And why this matters is because if a publication offers brands favourable coverage for payment, as the London Evening Standard was alleged to have offered Uber and Google, then under the ASA role, rules, we would not need to be told. Um, payment is possible without disclosure. And that, I think, is a deep problem and indicative of a wider set of deconvergence uh, persisting. Just as an encoder, 
to this example. Um, take a look at this. Um, this is actually the UK government falling foul of the advertising standards rules uh, in 2019 for advertorials carried in the Metro regional newspapers, uh, Metro Online and the Mail on the welfare benefit universal credit that were deemed by the regulator, quote, to have the potential to create some ambiguity as to whether or not they were ads or editorial. And in fact, in addition to that, so the government is being wrapped for failing to distinguish clearly an ad, but the complaints also concerned the substance of the material and um, all of those were upheld. Um, all the complaints against content, which is a damning verdict, surely, on a government information campaign. But also a reminder that the government in the UK, like most governments, has close dealings with commercial publishers here, which is relevant in unpacking and helping understand why branded content regulation is so disjointed and neglected as a topic. OK, so to finish, um, I'll just outline very briefly some proposals and suggestions for what we might do. Um, we have in audiovisual regulation a mandated system. Uh, we have to have a P sign when there's product placement in uh, original television content. Why on earth are we not doing the same across a wider swathe of communications? Why don't we have a B or an ad sign uh, much more pervasive? Secondly, um, and more deeply, perhaps a, a lot of these issues, and we have concerns about political advertising on Facebook alongside commercial branded content, converge on the issue of how well sources that inform the media are identified. Um, perhaps we need to move towards something like a list of ingredients, like food labeling, um, on the sources that have informed stories, and um, certainly in any case where there's a paid element, whilst at the same time protecting the anonymity of sources on public interest and human rights grounds. The protection of journalistic sources is a case that's going through uh, Chris Mullins' um, refusal to hand over details of the IRA um, bombers of Birmingham at the moment, uh, underscoring how important that principle is. But why not better identification across the piece? And then finally, and again more deeply, we really need to think about whether we need 20th century versions of those old rules of separation of advertising and non-advertising content, rethought and rebuilt for the new configurations of our communications. If those are some proposals, what very quickly are some prospects? Well, um, there is some hope. We're seeing technological advances within the industry. Um, Instagram, for example, giving deeper data uh, for compliance with its um, uh, disclosure rules, which is very interesting. Plenty of other examples. And I'm involved myself, so I'm a believer in, absolute believer in advancing good practice rules and self-regulation. And there are clearly some prospects for that alongside the more negative picture I've outlined about poor compliance and, and problems. Um, regulation itself, though, I think is outdated and non-convergent and needs significant overhaul. What are the prospects for market power? Well, we do have ad blocking. There are perhaps a range of re interesting responses, consumer resistance and refusal, but they don't add up to a very coordinated force um, combating the pressures driving branded content, in my view. And for more organized forms from civil society, well, challenges to advertising um, can be successful. We've seen that certainly with junk food, where powerful lobbies in that case, health and children are involved, but I don't see uh, us being anywhere near assembling those kinds of coalitions to act as a counterforce to the branded content and the problems I've outlined. So uh, there's my talk. I've tried to give you a tour of some of the arguments uh, in the book. It covers a broad range of practices across news and entertainment, old and new media. It traces problems and values and arguments that are activated around branded content, and it suggests some ways of how we might tackle them. Um, 
I do just want to touch on the implications for some of us here listening, which is for the academy. Um, brand media marketing convergence is surely of profound impact and implications for academic institutions and our own practices. The critical argument about the lack of integration in policy I outlined could easily be applied to the academy too, including how media studies, journalism, advertising and public relations needs to develop to engage with the convergence that's taking place. What do we need to do to support students um, as these convergences continue is a key question. Um, and I think we have to do many things, but they include creating space for dialogue and exchange. So there's a jargon phrase in academia, um, knowledge exchange. And I don't know about you, I think it's a terrible phrase. It gives me a mental image of a money exchange kiosk at an airport, useful, not a place you'd want to linger, almost certainly a place you're being ripped off and getting a worse deal than you would somewhere else. So it's a terrible phrase, but it's a really valuable and important concept because to advance, I think we do need, and to address that student need, we do need knowledge exchange. We need dialogue and collaboration to support research, to inform policy, and to support education and opportunities for students. So bringing together today um, people from all those parts that we want to reach as the Branded Content Research Hub and Network is very precious and important indeed. So thank you very much for listening and I hope we can open this up with some Q&A and then perhaps some broader contributions and discussion before we close. Thank you very much. So. Thank you, Jonathan. I think if we were on uh, on on site, we would have a welcoming round of applause. So please, you know, yes, virtual round of applause would be great. Thank you so much. Really compelling and fascinating um, discussion. I would like to um, open to the audience for anyone who does have any questions or comments for Jonathan. You're welcome to put them in the chat, but I think Jonathan would very much prefer if you were able to um, speak up and you know uh, field your own question. Um, so we'll just take a, and, and perhaps it would be useful to put the discount code into the chat for anyone who is interested in the book who doesn't have it already. I would say it's absolutely worth it. Um, so are there any questions? You're welcome to raise your hand or unmute and speak. Oh, I see a hand. Gareth, please do go ahead. Kick yeah. off with the first question. Hello, Jonathan. I'm sorry to be... Uh be blind but I'm in I'm, I'm in the office not far from you so I <laughs> haven't got the luxury of a camera here but but thanks for that it, it was a really uh, really nice really wonderful collection of ideas but it, and your triad took me back to Rupert Murdoch's great claim in the 90s which drove his whole strategy which is that content was king and you followed that slide with your sextet which mentioned platforms of course and I just wondered whether you thought that um, what is the real relative power between those two? Because I think it's it's fundamental to your closing point of regulation, isn't it? As to whether the platforms are publishers or not. I mean, it feeds into that question. So I just wonder if you could deal with that, whether you think content is still the, the, the thing that draws in audiences or whether it's the platforms that own them now and, the, and they that have the power. And it's content that's actually relatively weak and that may fade away. Uh, in the years to come. Oh, just before I answer, Gareth, just why don't you elaborate on that last point? <laughs> why will content fade away? Yeah, be because of this relative power of the platforms, I think, and the fact that media owners used to own um, own the eyeballs, didn't they, and own the content in that first triad that you described, I think. What we've sure. seen with the platforms is the the standoff, but I mean, I'm, 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 I don't want to personalize it too much to the, the famous you know, Facebook versus News International and Murdoch face off over news content and, and who pays and so on. But it's like, it's those sorts of battles that we're seeing is in the commercial world. And I think they're feeding into, into the way regulation is structured. So sure, that's well, what I was thinking about. Yeah, I, I think these are very complex. I, I think um, I understand now what you mean so content as if you like prestige content particularly associated with legacy media traditional uh, content it was absolutely legacy content yeah from, from, 
from that from that sort of era when Murdoch was spending his money to build content with this premise that content was king, um, only to be overtaken by the you know the, the, the sort of power of the of the, uh, of the platforms of Google and Facebook in particular. Well, I suppose um, to put that in a wider context, I've always been on the sceptical, critical side of the argument that, you know, Negroponte and being digital said the um, the monoliths of media companies will dissolve into cottage industries because of the onslaught of the Internet, the democratization and proliferation of content. Um, I don't think that happened yes. because we live in a complex mixed world where there are still huge advantages for the monopoly suppliers of content. Um, that content needs to be thought about beyond content. <laughs> you know, Netflix advantages are, are partly in content, but they're in platformness, they're in distribution, they're in um, cross promotion, actually, just to link to what I said. So it is a more complex world. I think um, we should always look at the complexity and contradictions of power configurations. But I think the key argument that links to my work is, you know, if you read Donatons, Madison and Vine and, and others, um, we were told a story of a massive shift of power from marketers and media to the consumer. And I think the lie to that is that there has been a huge shift of power of marketers over media, and that the question of consumer empowerment, well, let's just say needs to be opened up. So I'm not convinced that the consumer has been empowered uh, and those old forces have been weakened uh, as a compelling story. Um, it does contain um, very important elements of truth, uh, that does speak to very real things, but I think we should problematize it. Yeah, thank you very much. You're taking me back with Negroponte, by the way, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it well, this idea that the, the it was going to be readers and consumers and the, it, was, it was all going to be distributed power. That's why I'm particularly interested in the, exactly. uh, in yeah. the power of the platforms that, that's yeah. come up from behind to, to overtake those traditional media. But thanks very much. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks, Gareth. Thank Great you. question. Can we move on to uh, Cesar, please? Yes. Uh, well, thanks very much for the talk, Jonathan. And and also wanted to say hi to all of you. It's the first time that uh, I've read about you and I've read things written by several of you, but it's the first time that I see you, like, uh, even if you're totally. So my question is, is about fiction, because I feel that when in discussions, about this topic, we most of us tend to veer much more towards when journalism in particular uh, has a blurred boundary with branded content. But based on some of the points you were making at the beginning when you were talking about a Netflix series, uh, about uh, Black Mirror or Stranger Things, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, I've been thinking about, well, can we, should we, do we have to do mark divisions also in fiction? Like, for instance, I've noticed that if you have in a movie uh, a character smoking a cigarette, at the very, very end of the movie, after 10 minutes of credits, we can see a little, little sentence that almost nobody reads saying, oh, by the way, the tobacco industry didn't pay for anyone to smoke here. But and in, in regard to telling us, the, this is not an ad, but I'm not sure first how effective is that. And also, I cannot help thinking of Bond, okay? Because these movies are very much an ad for plenty of things. I once had the chance to talk to someone who works for Aston Martin, and it's amazing the level of negotiations that are behind that, that we're not aware of on which car we're going to show, which model, which year, how it's going to benefit, not only the plot of the movie, but how we as a company, uh, how we can promote certain models. So there are also instances of promotion, but but I wonder, yeah, what are your views on that? And, and perhaps that, yeah, what perhaps should be done about it? Do you have any thoughts about that? Thank you. Thank you so much, Cesar. It's really lovely you've come and to offer that question, and I really appreciate it too. I'm looking, I know Gloria wants to speak, but let me just do a shameless plug. One of my roles, and it's a great pleasure, is a series editor for a book series called Critical Advertising Studies, and it's been a real delight to help 
really worthy writers, um, some producing their first book, um, one of whom is Gloria for the work she did, and I'm sure she might want to say more, on uh, product placement and product integration in Italian film and television. So just to say to you, um, I, I'm really committed to a debate which moves us on from the old hierarchies of news and entertainment. And that's really informed a lot of my work. I've been involved, I still consider myself active in media reform movements. And um, it's, it's always dismayed me that so many of the arguments stand or fall on news. And it's completely insufficient. We should care deeply about how culture is produced, about the range of cultural diversity. So I've been very involved on the issue of product placement, and it really bears out some of the arguments you, you made. Um, advocates have often said, um, you know, film always showed a world of branded goods. Branded content is part of realism. Um, it's not problematic. But I think that those on my side of the argument said, you know, brands exercise control and the implications of that are really profound. There's a very interesting piece of research I quote in the book. Um, and I think, let me just caveat by saying, I think we need to do more on this. But it says um, the uh, car ad promotion in US movies gives a hugely distorted story about how people move around cities. Most people use public transport, but um, car product promotion is a factor, let's say, in shaping a display which is inaccurate and, of course, deeply damaging for our long term survival as well. So I think those issues really matter. I've always looked for inspiration to the Council of Europe, actually, which in the whole space of articulating a more plural media very much extends arguments around cultural diversity as much as news and information. And I, I really think it's important we do that here. Um, you know, I've been on platforms where brands have said we are the new patrons of the arts. And, you know, th th that has some upsides. Um, plenty of young filmmakers will only get to speak with the help of brands, and we should acknowledge that. But, yeah, I think it's a huge problem when marketers' voice extends. So it's not just an argument about journalism at all, uh, as I hope the book shows. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent question and response. And I think, as you noted, Jonathan, Gloria, please do go ahead. Thank you very much. Actually, my question is 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 very much linked to what Cesar has just asked because I, I I don't know. Maybe I'm playing the devil's advocate here a little bit. But in, in my experience, when when I do my my lectures on you know product placement and and branded integration in in cinema and and entertainment audiovisual media in particular, um, I always do this sort of of trick to the students where I show them. Uh, Werner Herzog, lo and behold, documentary, and then you know comes up with the with the information that it is actually a piece of branded content, mm -hmm. and I use a little bit of of examples in this sense, and then I always ask them, you know, did your opinion on on these pieces of entertainment changed or or what you know once you've learned that they are uh, paid for uh, or controlled uh, at different degrees. Uh, by marketers and the reality is that most of them say not really um, it's it, they, they are sort of very much secular uh, if, if we can use this term you know they say well you know as, as long as the content is um, I don't know it's it's not completely uh, incoherent with the brand's image or with the brand's um, uh, reputation, uh, it's it doesn't bother me. So and and I always, you know, it, to me, it's 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 always kind of, yeah, it, it's it's difficult because I don't know how to react because I spent you know the whole lectures you know showing examples and maybe it's I don't know maybe it's up to me who who can really. Uh, I'm not really able to explain uh, the criticalities of, of these trends. Uh, maybe I, I should do a better job in this, but I don't know. I, I just wanted to ask you and maybe other, other people in these meetings, if they, you know, if they are working on these topics, uh, whether they had this sort of experience and what do you think about that? 
Well, um, I, I'll respond. I'll just um, flip back to news because I must say, um, well, two things actually, and what one's important to say. You know, I'm a critical scholar. I have a take on this, but as an educator, you know, my role is to facilitate a debate, not to close it down for students. So I don't want to create an environment where a student feels obligated to agree with Professor Hardy. Um, far from it. And I think opening up a space which actually educates on some of the real contradictions. You know, um, branded content is a major funder for independent film, film, film and cultural production on the margins, uh, not just in the mainstream. And we have to incorporate that because some of the students I teach here may well want to be funded filmmakers in that space. But certainly when I do news and I get students to identify if they can sponsored content, native advertising, journalism, the reproduction of press releases, and they struggle, some of them with experience of working in journalism. That's always quite a nice um, uh, eye open a moment and um, we, we can have a fun conversation. But I mean, I suppose th the other answer to you is it's the difference between the decisions that, um, sorry, I've got a wave to get some light, um, the decisions that affect a particular piece of content. And I would say there, one of the key issues for us is accountability. We don't know increasingly what's going on. In the UK, there used to be a rule of um, undue prominence. And people like me who argued against product placement argued how important that rule was because it enabled ordinary people to say, hang on, this close up of a Nokia phone or an Apple laptop, increasingly Apple laptops, um, is undue prominence. Uh, what are you doing about it? It's it's brand interference. And that role exi that rule exists, but it's quite poorly enforced. Certainly when I've complained or other people have, um, we don't get much of a hearing. So, um, you know, we don't know what's happening. But the bigger issue, going back to Cesar's point, is about the wider allocative decisions. It's about how cumulative decisions get shaped by brands and what advertisers will want. And I think your students, like others, would say, well, those cumulative decisions will favour what advertisers favour, which is upscale young people, and they'll disfavour other voices, um, which are important in society, the poor, the old, the marginalised, will not be favoured by a brand patronage system, and, and we should care about that. Fascinating answer there, opening up all sorts of issues around how we think about content and genre, really. Um, on that note, uh, could we turn to Bjorn for your question? Sure, uh, and thank you, Jonathan. And you know, it's great to see the book, and I think it pulls together your work from all you know, all the different streams of the phenomenon. It's it's really great to see how it's all uh, coming together. And and obviously, Jonathan and I, we, we have been debating. Uh, the, the phenomenon uh, quite a bit yes. and it's it's wonderful to to see this almost impossible task of of bringing all the different streams together uh, being being fulfilled but um i i have a i don't know if it's a tricky question but maybe a challenging uh, yeah. question i don't know if you maybe you find it very easy you you talked a, a, a lot today and also in the book about all the issues with branded content, um, that there is a lot of infiltration by marketing when it comes to our media, our culture, our lives. And obviously I, I uh, used to work in the marketing industry. Now I teach marketing, I teach branded content. So I would like to know from you, Jonathan, if you, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier marketers support some independent art, independent film, uh, etc. But it, could you give us maybe an example of a good piece of branded content you have come across? Or is branded content for you by definition misleading or, or even evil or capitalist? Um, well, thank you, Bjorn, and I'm very grateful for you to come. And just to replay the compliment, certainly your work defining branded content, and I know it's ongoing work for you, was really important and influential and opens up a debate may maybe we should come on to, which is certainly exercised me for some work I'm doing now between the whole promotional landscape 
in which everyone is embedded to varying degrees, self-promotional and and the more organized forms of branded content. But just to well, I, I would try and reassure you on two points, and you know this very well, but let me share this more widely. Um, it's been a great privilege to put together a network uh, to examine branded content, and that network stretches from the lead industry bodies. Um, my colleague Andrew Cantor from the Branded Content Marketing Association and Content Marketing Association, right through, if you want to form it in these terms, as a spectrum to Marxist professors. Um, and I'm very pleased and proud of that coalition because it really realizes that point I was making about knowledge exchange. We, we need a respectful dialogue um, because all the goods, better research, better understanding, um, but importantly, better benefits for our students come out of that. And I teach students who I know, uh, I teach now on, a, on an MA in advertising, want and will work in this space. And I can teach them with um, a very clear conscience uh, on the upsides. But I want to have space for my voice to, to highlight uh, the negatives. So to answer your question, I mean, uh, well, a standout for me, I like showing um, ads for Christmas um, and I have to say other seasonal um, festivals too. Um, so we looked at, um, uh, I think it's from Norway. Um, it's, a, it's a piece of longer form branded content in which Father Christmas has a gay male relationship um, with, with someone who only sees him fleetingly once a year. It's a very classic piece of powerful, emotional, impactful storytelling. Um, it's connected to cause related marketing and it does it very well. So that's the kind of material I would show my students. Uh, but for me, that fits into that first grouping um, brand's own content. The issues and problems, I think, are much more located um, in in the integrated forms, but perhaps just link this back to Cesar. I also reflect in the book, you know, criticisms of things like always like a girl campaign, which again is a complex thing. This was a very powerful and important statement about the loss of confidence hitting young girls um, on maturity and and addressing that and combating it. At the same time, I quote a critique which says in the end, you know, there's limits to what a brand selling panty liners can do to address the empowerment of women and young girls. And I agree with that, too. There are limitations to branded voice, but it doesn't mean they can't be a powerful voice and a progressive voice, too. So we have to address all of those issues and contradictions. And I think engage students in that space and let them make up their minds and make up their own paths and 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 encourage them to choose all those paths. And encourage uh, them to to see the advantages as well as as critical sides. I, I hope I've said that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 No, and uh, uh, Jonathan, I wonder, would you be happy to share your slides uh, with us? I don't know if that's technical uh, possible. Yeah, in fact, if I may, let me just, I think my Q&A is up. Let me also just take this opportunity to... Just to say, Jonathan, there is one more question uh, from Maluka. And if there is time, I have a question, but we don't need to... Um, address that if there's yeah. not time. But, but just to say, Bill, um, we're going to put an edited film of this presentation and the Q&A um, up on the hub. And um, yes, I think the easiest thing to say is if anyone who's has come today, I'm so grateful to you for coming, who would like the slides, get in touch with me directly and I'll send you a copy. I certainly benefited from yours back in 2016, Bill. Great, thank you so much, um, and very useful to have the list of talks coming up. Jonathan, do you want to take a few more questions, or please? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I I was working with the timeline uh, that we're going to close at five, so I think we do have a, a few more minutes. So Raluca, your hand was raised, um, and then I would actually like to uh, take advantage of Chair's uh, role and also ask a question. So. Um, just before turning to you, Raluca Shirley has posted in the chat a booking link if anyone is interested in the, the next talk. So please do um, click on that. Raluca, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciated your talk. Thank you very much for the book launch, Jonathan. Really, really interesting and inspiring. And um, 
I think adds a lot of layers of complexity. My question would be more about specifically these blurring lines between native advertising and news agenda and agenda building. Specifically, very recently, um, a research in 2022, in 20, uh, what they looked at, it's, um, I mean, I can send you the link, but it basically is, is a very interesting research that tried to connect um, the increase of native advertising for, uh, for specific media outlets and the decreasing of investigative journalism for those specific brands. It hasn't been necessarily found as a, a direct connection. However, the researchers said that they found for the 16 of the companies, news coverage noticeably decreased after native ad advertisement was published. And that's in the case of US. Um, so discussing about these blurring lines and mostly um, agenda cutting versus agenda building, right? Um, I'm more interested in if you can explore a little bit more about these uh, these specific uh, areas and this kind of connection or possible connection between increase of native advertising and decrease of news coverage for those brands. Thank you so much. Well, if, if Cesar will forgive me, this of course takes us back, you know, culture matters, but news and information most certainly does. And, you know, those um, transactional relationships, which are opaque and complex and often protracted, um, not just over a, a piece of content, are really, really important. And I deal with quite a few examples in the book. So one of them is the um, resignation of Peter Oborn from The Telegraph, who basically said, the dependence on HBC uh, Bank um, as an advertiser was neutering the range of content of the financial crisis in a way that deserved readers. Um, and that kind of charge really matters and is really amplified. And I think the research also shows very powerfully how it extends across a whole range of actors and increasingly governments are intervening. Um, there's an example I quote in the book um, where Reuters was subject to um, essentially rebuttal native advertising by a government which was being challenged over the slavery conditions of, of, um, of, of workers in the ports and surrounding. So um, yeah, we, we have an old discourse in the news about the chill effect of censorship. Um, and I, I my plea is that we really need to pay attention to these traditionally neglected areas of commercial speech um, because they're really important in, in just the way you said. And we need more research sort of uncovering those, those tentacles. Um, another example quite recently, Open Democracy has just done a major expose on Saudi native advertising and its influence in British media. Um, and a, a, another one which I cite in the book, which really shows the longevity of this, is about Exxon and the way advertorials and what we now call native advertising, um, you know, was a contributor to climate denial um, by fossil fuel companies in major American newspapers. So it's back to Cesar's point in a way, it's how money talks and how traditionally we've set limits on advertising because that power is is um, unique. Nobody else has a power to speak just by paying for it. Um, so we set limits on where advertising could take place and what separation there should be to protect other things like, like news. And those protections are weakening. Um, and, and that's the critical argument. Thanks, Rudy. Really fascinating discussion. And actually, if I'm perfectly honest, I have a lot of questions. So I'm holding, exercising considerable constraint um, from wanting to jump in. But, the, you know, there's a few things you said. And just to go back to your tight, your, the title of your book, um, The Fateful Merging of Media Marketing, which I think is so compelling. Um, uh, so my question is, you know, what does, what, what is that fate, what in your view is that fateful merging? How is the relationship changing um, with this merging? Um, and what really are the really broad implications socially, 
um, and for um, our communications industries. And if there's time, I might ask a, a follow up. But there we go. That's that's a short question for you, Jonathan. Well, well it, it really just reiterates what I said. I think we've had a world which has found ways to set limits on marketers' power and voice. And those are weakening in a whole variety of ways from formal regulation to what's acceptable, going back to Gloria's point, you know, the weakening of, of a, a kind of counter argument that's compelling to the young people who are going to move into this industry. And I, th I think, you know, there is an upside to take Bjorn's point. Branded content is complex. It's not singular. We need to be careful when we're identifying where the problems are. But that um, merging is um, transformative and raises fundamental issues because if we can't set limits on brand speech, um, then I think that affects the entire communication environment that we can enjoy. So again, linking to Gloria's point, it's not just about picking up on an instance of product placement. It's really an argument about saying, what happens to the non-commercial, the, um, the, the, the non-invaded communication spaces? How can those be protected and expanded going forward? Great, thank you so much. And um, just a quick different um, question for you. And just to know, I remember having to wave as well to keep the lights on. Um, one of the things, and you mentioned this a little bit uh, in Gareth's question, um, when you're talking about the, you know, the power of consumers and users, and you also mentioned in your talk, the key agencies of influence as law and regulation, industry self-regulation, market power, which is consumer action, and civil society. And one of the things I was thinking about that argument about the shift towards more user power and decreased barriers for content production and even the potential for branded content um, to support arts at the margins. Um, where do you see the user in all of this? Um, because I think when I understand market power, consumer action and civil society, these are collectives, these are groups. So I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on that aspect. Well, it's interesting. I've been reflecting on this. I think um, I, I see myself operating within the critical political economy of media tradition. And that tradition has looked at consumer protest and consumer power. The work of Inga Stoll, for example, on um, consumer resistance. So there is a tradition, but I think it's relatively thin and weak and neglected. And I do think, and I'm sure I agree with you and your research in this area, that we do need to pay much more attention to how power and empowerment can and does occur with users. And again, certainly speaking to academics in this room, as ever, we have to accept the great complexities and contradictions. But to cut through that, I do think um, there are also some overarching narratives which need to be challenged and dispelled. I think the notion that we have seen a shift from media and marketers to consumer empowerment at that top line level um, is is powerfully disproved and problematic. But within it, you know, um, I, I'm connected to campaigns which encourage brands not to advertise in um, right wing newspapers and so on, stop funding hate, stop hate for profit, sleeping giants and so on. Those are really interesting and important initiatives. And again, it goes back to Gloria's point of sort of laying out for our students that range and menu by which people do engage with these issues um, and, and to kind of to share with them that, well, some people are protesting and this is how they're doing it. I think it's really, really important. So users are complex, though. <laughs> um, very comprehensive answer, though, covered a lot there. And I think, um, yes, they're absolutely complex. I did see a hand um, from Leslie. I don't know if she wants yes. to share her question. Um, Actually, you thank you asked my my question, so um, because I was going to also point out that there seems to be a, a lot of campaigning that where people understand who sponsors are. That seems to me a much more um, <clears throat> obvious thing for them. And so, I, my question was going to be more about um, whether you felt that there was uh, this kind of campaigning was not as active because people were not as aware of the, you know, the um, more subtle involvement of branding in those cases and um, whether you also felt that 
this was more of a rogue kind of reaction that um, people have personal vendettas or feelings about about brands that really um, maybe motivates them in a different way than perhaps just about keeping brands out of uh, editorial content. Wow. Um, yeah, I think it's complex too. I think this should be a media literacy issue. But going back to what I was saying about sort of policy compartmentalization, you know, we, we haven't seen that happen. So I don't think people are being as assisted as they could be in recognizing uh, and challenging um, these issues. So, for example, you know, we have an online harms, an on, sorry, an online safety bill in the UK at the moment in which the government is disposed to take out advertising in a way that I think would protect commercial advertisers from being brought into a conversation which they don't really want to be in, which is about identification, tackling political advertising, strengthening media literacy. So I, I, I do think, you know, part of the, what's happening is, is the forces that are neutering and restricting a space for greater education and greater engagement, but, but, be, but you know, it, it, it certainly happens. Uh, just one example, and maybe this links to Raluca. There was a, a, an initiative in California um, to challenge film junkets. So citizens of, of California uh, came together and said, we think we should be told when the reviewer of the film has been on a junket, put up in the hotel, got the merchandise for their family and children, um, that should be labelled. Of course, they lost the case. But, uh, but I'm all for that. Maybe the final one. Um, the other thing I show my students is the Guardian's demarcation between whether something's sponsored and they claim editorially they're in charge, whether it's, um, sorry, I don't want to, um, wh whether it's um, advertiser controlled or, wh or whether it's paid content like the example I gave. And I show my students this because you need a bit of sophistication to decode those labels. So, you know, the industry has has not created consistent labeling, hasn't gone in the direction of B signs, which could be everywhere. It's gone in the direction of quite complicated idiosyncratic solutions. So it's a really important issue you raise. Media literacy for all is my rallying call. Wonderful, very um, fascinating. I, I think we could we could continue. Um, I don't know, Jonathan, if you want to very take very very quickly take a last question in the chat, which is about diversity and uh, inclusion in branded content. Um, if you could answer briefly, then I think that will bring us to the end of end of this wonderful, compelling, thought provoking launch. Well, thanks very much for that question. Um, again, on the critical side, I cite um, Francesca Saban's wonderful work on um, challenging um, brands' uh, kind of uh, appropriation of powerful causes like Black Lives Matter and so on. But I would just say, and it goes back to Bjorn's um, point, uh, I was showing students throughout the course wonderful examples of of Oh, pro-inclusion, pro-diversity branded content. There's no doubt that, you know, a few years ago at Cannes Lions, um, words like um, unstereotyping and inclusion were the key buzzwords. And, you know, the best of branded content most certainly reflects that. So there, there are powerful signs of progress. Um, there's also deep um, inequality and exploitation. Many of the people involved in producing this branded content are very poorly paid, and we should absolutely recognize that for creating a more diverse industry. So it, it, it's a mixed picture, but I'm really grateful for that. Can I just say, though, to finish, I'm so grateful for you all to give up your time to come to this. It's a real pleasure to launch the hub um, with, with uh, although we're remote, with, with you all too. And I know some of you are not in this country, but I do promise that we will invite you to a summer event, which will be the, um, the, the refreshment side of today's event. Um, but thank you so much for coming and taking part and for such really valuable and, and stimulating questions. Really grateful. And can I say, you know, if we can all put our hands together to thank Jonathan for a really provocative, compelling, impressive work 
both in the book as well as the branded content research hub which promises to keep delivering important contributions to how we understand the field so thank you very much jonathan and thank you to all the contributors um uh in the in the discussion and that brings us to the end thank you so thank you bye everyone cheers